Chapter 1. The Way Out is In Pay attention to your inner mechanism. Everything happens from within. Everything you have done in your life so far has been in pursuit of a single thing. Whether you sought a career, started a business, made money, or built a family, it was always because you wanted one simple thing, joy. But somewhere along the way, life got complicated. Let us start with a single question. What do we consider to be a state of well-being? Very simply, well-being is just a deep sense of pleasantness within. If your body feels pleasant, we call this health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If they become very pleasant, we call this compassion. If your life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If they become very pleasant, we call this ecstasy. This is what we are all seeking, pleasantness within and without. When pleasantness is within, it is termed peace, joy, and happiness. When your surroundings become pleasant, it gets branded success. If you're not interested in any of this and want to go to heaven, what are you seeking? Just otherworldly success. Essentially, all human experience is only a question of pleasantness and unpleasantness to varying degrees. But how many times in your life have you lived an entire day blissfully without a single moment of anxiety, agitation, irritation, or stress? How many times have you lived in utter and absolute pleasantness for 24 hours? When was the last time it happened to you? The amazing thing is that for most people on this planet, not a single day has happened exactly the way they want it. Of course, there is no one who has not experienced joy, peace, even bliss, but it is always fleeting. They are unable to sustain it. They manage to get there, but it keeps collapsing, and nothing earth-shattering needs to happen for it to collapse. The simplest things throw people off balance, out of kilter. The thing that stands between you and your well-being is a simple fact. You have allowed your thoughts and emotions to take instruction from the outside rather than the inside. Everything that ever happened to you, you experienced right within you. Sadguru. If your thoughts and your emotions are of your making, you can mold them any way you like. There is scientific proof today that without ingesting a drop of alcohol or any other substance, you can get fully intoxicated by yourself. An Israeli organic chemist, Raphael Metrulam, and his research team initiated a project that eventually isolated a bliss molecule in the human system. In lay terms, they discovered that the human brain has natural cannabis receptors. Our body is capable of producing its own narcotic. Why is this so? The body can manufacture its own bliss with no external stimulus, and that too, with no hangover. The reason why certain chemical substances, like alcohol and recreational drugs, are dangerous is that they can reduce your awareness, ruin your health, create addictions, and destroy you. But here is a bliss narcotic that is created and consumed by your own system and which has a tremendous impact on health and well-being. It means that the human system is wonderfully self-contained. Other similar chemicals have been discovered more recently as well, but this particular chemical has been named anandamide, based on the Sanskrit word ananda, which means bliss. We can infer from this that happiness is just a certain kind of chemistry. Peace is another kind of chemistry. In fact, every kind of pleasantness that we experience, whether peace or joy or ecstasy, is a kind of chemistry. The yogic system has always known this. There is a technology for inner well-being, for creating a chemical basis for blissful existence. This is one dimension of what the author calls inner engineering. 
If you are aware, you can activate your system in such a way that simply breathing is an enormous pleasure. All it takes is a willingness to pay a little attention to the inner mechanism. This is the fundamental shift in understanding that has to happen. Do not look for a way out of misery. Do not look for a way out of suffering. There is only one way, and that is in. Chapter 2. Design Your Destiny. Wake up to yourself as an existential being so you can ride situations around you and don't get crushed by them. When pain, misery, or anger happen, it is time to look within you, not around you. What you forget is that when you are sick, it is you who needs the medication. When you are hungry, it is you who needs the food. The only one that needs to be fixed is you. To understand this simple fact, for some people, it takes a lifetime. To achieve well-being, the only one who needs to be fixed is you. Creating your destiny is about steadily heading toward your well-being and your ultimate nature, no matter what the content of life is around you. It simply means making yourself in such a way that, whatever the events and situations around you, you don't get crushed by them. You ride them. Creating your own destiny does not mean you have to control every situation in the world. It doesn't matter who you are. Life doesn't work for you unless you do the right things. You may consider yourself a good person, but if you don't water your garden, will it flower? No, you need to do the right things if you want results. Judgments about good and bad are essentially human and socially conditioned. These are fine as social norms, but existence is not concerned with these conclusions. Existence is not judgmental. It treats all of us the same way. One winter in Michigan, an old-timer went ice fishing. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. He cut a small hole in the ice and sat down with a crate of beer beside him. Fishing is not just about the catch. It is a patience game. He knew that. He put the line in. One by one, the beer cans started emptying out. The fishing basket also stayed empty. The day drew on. At four o'clock in the afternoon, his basket was still empty. So was his crate of beer. A young boy came along. He was carrying a big boom box that played deafening heavy metal music. He cut a hole in the ice nearby and sat down to fish, his music still blaring. The old-timer glanced at him with ill-disguised contempt. I've been sitting here since morning quietly with not a single fish, and the fool thinks he can catch fish with music blaring at four in the afternoon. No fool like a young fool. To his amazement, within ten minutes, the boy landed a huge trout. The old man dismissed it as a lucky break and continued fishing. Ten minutes later, the boy caught one more big trout. Now, the old man could ignore it no longer. He stared at the boy, dumbfounded, and just then, to his utter disbelief, the boy landed one more huge trout. The old-timer cast his pride aside and walked slowly over to the boy. What is the secret? he asked. I've been sitting here the whole day and my basket is empty. You already have three huge trout. What's going on? The boy said, Roo, 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 roo. The old man put his hand to his ear and asked, What? The boy turned down the stereo and said, roo, 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 roo. The old man was perplexed. I don't understand a word you're saying. The boy spat a blob of something into his hand and said, You have to keep the worms warm. Did you know, unless you do the right things, the right things will not happen to you. Principles and philosophies are only of social consequence. It's time to wake up to yourself as an existential being, a living being, rather than a psychological case. Then your destiny will be your own, 100% your own. This is not an idle promise, it's a guarantee. Chapter 3. Being fully responsible is to be fully conscious. 
Let us settle what we mean by the term responsibility. Responsibility is a much misunderstood term. It has been used so widely and indiscriminately that it has lost much of its inner voltage. Responsibility does not mean taking on the burdens of the world. It does not mean accepting blame for things you have done or not done. It does not mean living in a state of perpetual guilt. Responsibility does not mean taking on the burdens of the world. It simply means your ability to respond. If you decide, I am responsible, you will have the ability to respond. If you decide, I am not responsible, you will not have the ability to respond. It's as simple as that. All it requires is for you to realize that you are responsible for all that you are and all that you are not, all that may happen to you and all that may not happen to you. This is not a mind game. This is not a self-help strategy for easy living. This is not a philosophical theory. This is a reality. Your physical existence is possible only because of your body's seamless ability to respond to the entire universe. If your body isn't responding, you wouldn't be able to exist for a moment. Do you see that? What the trees around you are exhaling, you are inhaling right now. What you are exhaling, the trees are inhaling at this very moment. This transaction is ongoing. Whether you are aware of it or not, one half of your pulmonary system is hanging up there right now on a tree. You have never experienced this interdependence. You have probably, at the most, thought about it intellectually. But if you had experienced this connection, would anyone have to tell you, plant trees, protect the forests, save the world? Would it even be necessary? Taking responsibility is not a convenient philosophy to reconcile you to the way things are. It is simply waking up to reality. The ability to respond to the entire universe is already a physical reality. It is only your thoughts and emotions that need to become conscious of the fact. Now that we have established what responsibility is, it is time to look at what it is not. Let us start by clearing up a few fundamental misconceptions. For one, many believe that taking responsibility compromises their freedom. This seems to be logically true on a simplistic level. Existentially, it is completely off the mark. Let us consider a concrete scenario. Your pen falls off a table. If you see you are responsible for it, you have several choices before you. You could simply bend down and pick it up. If you're unable to do that, you could ask someone for help. Or if you aren't inclined to act on it right now, you might pick it up later. You have a variety of options. If, on the other hand, you don't take responsibility for it, what can you do? Nothing. Which is freedom? To have choices or to have none? Your logical mind tells you, give up all responsibility and you will be free. But in your experience of life, the more you are able to respond to everything around you, the freer you are. The logical and experiential dimensions of life work in diametrically opposite ways. Logic is not without its uses, but this helps only to handle the material aspects of life. If you handle your entire life with logic alone, you will end up a mess. Secondly, people often confuse responsibility with reaction. There is a world of difference between the two. The first is born in awareness, the second in unawareness. The first is born in consciousness, the second in unconsciousness. The first is freedom, the second is enslavement. Responsibility is not reaction, but it is not action either. Chapter 4. What exactly is yoga? If you were to close your eyes and conjure an image, it would probably be one of bodies twisted into impossible postures, bone bending, muscle knotting, teeth gnashing contortionism. That, for many, is yoga. The trend is changing nowadays to some extent, and many yoga studios also impart breathing techniques and meditation processes. 
So for some people, the image of yoga might be one of serenely smiling faces and perfect bodies seated effortlessly in a lotus position. But none of that is what we mean when we talk the science of yoga. Yoga is not a practice. It's not an exercise. It's not a technique. The images in popular consciousness point to a bowdlerized form of yoga that has now pervaded the world. This is a travesty of the science of extraordinary grandeur and profundity that originated on the Indian subcontinent. The science of yoga is the science of being in perfect alignment, in absolute harmony, in complete sync with existence. Modern science tells us that all of existence is just energy manifesting itself in different ways and in different forms. This means that the same energy that can sit here as a rock, can lie there as mud, can stand up as a tree, can run like a dog, or be here reading this book like you. So you are essentially a morsel of energy that is part of the much larger energy system of the universe. The cosmos is just one big organism. Your life is not independent of it. You cannot live without the world because there is a very deep moment-to-moment transaction between the two of you. Although everything in the universe is the same energy, it functions at different levels of capability in different forms. The same energy functions in one plant to create roses. In another plant, it functions to create jasmine. With the same material with which people made earthen pots, we now make computers, cars, and even spacecraft. It is the same material. We have just started using it for higher and higher possibilities. Essentially, natural evolution is a similar phenomenon. From the same material of this planet, what an incredible journey has been made from an amoeba to a human being. It is the same with our inner energies. Yoga is the technology of upgrading, activating, and refining inner energies for the highest possibilities. Suddenly, your capabilities reach a level of brilliance that you never imagined possible. An accidental and limited life turns near miraculous. Yoga tells us that we are actually composed of five sheaths or layers, or more simply, bodies. As there is medical physiology, there is a yogic one as well. It leads us from the gross to the subtlest levels of reality. Do you have to believe in it? No, but it is a useful place at which to start our exploration. Your fundamental area of work, however, is only with the realities that you are aware of. The first sheath or layer to which yoga draws our attention is the physical body, the anamaya kosha, or more literally, the food body. What you call the body right now is just an accumulated heap of food. It is the product of all the nourishment you have ingested over the years. That is how it gets its name. The second layer is the manamaya kosha, or the mental body. Today, doctors are talking a great deal about psychosomatic ailments. This means that what happens in the mind affects what happens in the body. This is because what you call mind is not just the brain. It is not located in any single part of the human anatomy. Instead, every cell has its own intelligence. So there is an entire mental body, an entire anatomy of the mind. Whatever happens in the mental body happens in the physical body, and, in turn, whatever happens in the physical body happens in the mental body. Every fluctuation on the level of the mind has a chemical reaction, and every chemical reaction, in turn, generates a fluctuation on the level of the mind. The third layer of the self is the pranamaya kosha, or the energy body. The fourth layer, called the Vijnana Maya Kosha, or the etheric body. Jnana means knowledge. Vishesh Jnana means extraordinary knowledge, that which is beyond the sense perceptions. This is a transient state. It is neither physical nor non-physical. It is like a link between the two. There is also a fifth sheath, the Anandamaya Kosha, which is beyond the physical entirely. Ananda means bliss. 
It has nothing to do with the physical realms of life. A dimension that is beyond the physical cannot be described or even defined, so yoga talks about it only in terms of experience. When we are in touch with that aspect beyond the physical, we become blissful. It is not that a bubble of bliss lies within your physical structure. It is just that when you access this indefinable dimension, it produces an overwhelming experience of bliss. Chapter 5. The Human Body is the Ultimate Machine The most intimate part of physical creation for all of us is our own bodies. The physical body is the first gift of which we are aware of. It is also the ultimate machine. Every other machine on the planet has come out of this. The yogic sciences do not speak of the mind or the soul. Everything is just a body, whether it is a food body, a mind body, an energy body, an etheric body, or a bliss body. There is a deep wisdom in this approach. It does not allow us to escape into diluted psychological states or into flights of metaphysical abstraction. It grounds us firmly in the tangible, even if it leads us into subtler realms of physicality and gradually into the beyond. The physical body is designed and structured to function by itself without much of your intervention. You don't have to make the heart beat, the liver perform all its complex chemistry, or even try to breathe. Everything that is needed for your physical existence to manifest itself is happening on its own. The human body is a pretty complete and self-contained instrument. If you are fascinated by machines, there isn't a better one. This is the most sophisticated piece of machinery on this planet. It embodies the highest level of mechanics, the highest level of electronics, the most sophisticated electrical circuitry you can imagine. Let us say you eat a banana this afternoon. By evening, the banana has become you. According to Charles Darwin, it took millions of years to make a monkey into a human being, but in just a few hours, you are capable of making a banana or a piece of bread into a human being. Obviously, the very source of creation is functioning within you. There is an intelligence at work within you, way beyond your logical mind, which can transform a bit of food into the highest piece of technological excellence. If you could achieve that transformation consciously instead of unconsciously, if you could bring even a drop of that intelligence into your daily life, you would live magically, not miserably. It is because he experienced the source of creation throbbing within him that the 12th century Indian mystic Basavana famously called the body a moving temple. My legs are pillars, he says in one of the well-known verses of South Indian mystical literature, the body of the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. Chapter 6. Life Sense, Knowing Life Beyond the Senses How does the human body make sense of the world? What is its source of knowing? The answer is obvious, through the five senses. Whatever you know of the world, or yourself, is information you have gathered only through the five sense organs, by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. If these sense organs fold up, you would know neither the world nor yourself. When you sleep every night, suddenly the people around you disappear, the world disappears, and even you disappear. You are still alive, everybody around you is alive, but in your experience, everything evaporates because these five sense organs have gone into shutdown mode. The sense organs are limited. They can perceive only that which is physical. If your perception is limited to the five senses, naturally the scope of your life would be restricted to the physical. Additionally, the senses perceive everything only in relation to something else. If you touch a metal object and it feels cool to your fingers, it is simply because your body temperature is warmer. 
The sense perceptions are absolutely wonderful instruments for human survival. They are turned on at the moment of your birth because they are essential to your survival in the outside world. But if you are seeking something more than survival, they are not enough. They give you a distorted impression of reality because they are entirely relative in their perception. If you are really interested in knowing life in all its depth and dimension, it is imperative that you look inward, not out. Why? Because the essential nature of life does not lie in the physical or psychological expression of body and mind, but in their source. However, looking inward doesn't happen easily. It takes work because you don't yet have the perceptual mechanisms to look within. The human predicament is just this. The very seat of your experience is within you, but your perception is entirely outward bound. This is why there is such a big disconnect between within and without. You can see what is outside you, but you cannot see what is inside you. Even if someone whispers, you can hear it, but there is so much activity happening in the body that is beyond your ability to hear. Even if an ant crawls upon your skin, you can sense it right away, but there is so much blood flowing within you that you cannot feel. Your sense organs can only register external sensations of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. But the source of all experience is within you. An experience may be triggered by an external stimulus, but its origin is always internal. And there are times when the same experience can be generated even without an external trigger. Yoga is fundamentally aimed at enhancing your experience beyond the five senses. There is a dimension beyond your five sense perceptions. You can call that dimension whatever you please. You can call it self if you choose. You can call it divine if you choose. You can term it God if you choose. The terminology is entirely up to you. Turning inward does not have anything to do with your thoughts, ideas, opinions, or philosophies. It has nothing to do with the psychological activity of your mind. Enhancing your perception means enhancing your ability to receive life just as it is. If you're willing to dedicate just a few minutes of your life to this every day, you would see the change. The simple process of paying a little bit of attention to your inner nature will transform the quality of your life in remarkable ways. Chapter 7. Your body is like a barometer. If you know how to read it, it can tell you everything about you and the world around you. Until recently in India, after every storm, you had to go up to your roof and adjust your TV antenna. Only if it was angled in a certain way did the world pour into your living room. Or else, as you were watching your favorite soap opera or football match, a blizzard would suddenly appear on your screen. The body is like that antenna. If you hold it in the right position, it becomes receptive to all there is in existence. If you hold it another way, you will remain obviously ignorant of everything beyond the five senses. Here's another analogy. Your body is like a barometer. If you know how to read it, it can tell you everything about you and the world around you. The body never lies. So in yoga, we learn to trust the body. We transform the physical body from a series of compulsions of flesh, blood, and hormones into a conscious process, a powerful instrument of perception and knowing. If you know how to read the body, it can tell you your potential, your limitations, even your past, present, and future. This is why the fundamental yoga starts with the physical body. It is as simple as this. The more you know about your telephone or any other gadget, the better you can use it. A few years ago, cell phone companies conducted a survey and found that 97% of the people were using only 7% of a phone's capabilities. That is not talking about the smartphone here, but the dumb one. Even with that simple gizmo, people were using only 7%. Now, as we have already said, this body of yours is the ultimate machine, the perfect state-of-the-art gadget. 
What percentage of this machine do you think you're employing? Well, below 1%. To conduct your life in the material world, to ensure your survival, you do not need even 1% of the body's capabilities. We are doing all kinds of trivial things with it because right now, our whole perception of life is limited to the physical nature of existence. Your body is capable of perceiving the whole universe. If you prepare it properly, it can grasp everything in this existence because all that happens to this existence is happening in some way to this body. All physical creation is fundamentally a certain perfection of geometry. Without geometry, no physical form is possible. If we get the geometry of the human body right, it becomes capable of reflecting the larger geometry of the cosmos within and making the cosmic available for our experience. In other words, the human body is capable of downloading the entire cosmos. Chapter 8 you need to eat the right kind of food depending on your inclination and what you want out of your life. Your physical body is just an accumulation of food. Yoga pays much attention to food because what kind of food you put into the system has a tremendous impact on the kind of body you have constructed. There is a whole yogic science behind what to eat, how to eat, and when to eat. What kind of stuff you put into it determines the quality of the body and how comfortable it is with itself. Are you preparing this body to run as swiftly as a cheetah? Or are you preparing this body to carry 200 pounds? Or are you preparing this body so that it becomes conducive for higher meditative possibilities? You need to eat the right kind of food depending on your inclination and what you want out of your life. The way you eat not only decides your physical health, but the very way you think, feel, and experience life. Trying to eat intelligently means understanding what kind of fuel this body is designed for and accordingly supplying it so that it functions at its best. What kind of food is the human system really designed for? If you eat certain foods, the body becomes happy. If you eat certain other foods, the body turns dull and lethargic and your sleep quota increases. If you sleep for eight hours a day and you live a hundred years, you have spent one third of your life sleeping. Another 30 to 40 percent is spent on food, toilet, and other ablutions. There is very little time left for life. You eat food for energy, but if you eat a big meal, do you feel energetic or lethargic? Depending upon the quality of the food that you eat, you first feel lethargy, and then slowly you start feeling energetic. Why is this so? One aspect is the fact that your system cannot digest cooked food as it is. It needs certain enzymes to do so. All the enzymes necessary for the digestive process are not present in the body alone. The food that you eat also contains these enzymes. When you cook the food, generally 80 to 90 percent of the enzymes are destroyed, so the body is struggling to reconstitute those destroyed enzymes. The enzymes that you destroy in cooking can never be totally reconstituted, so generally, for most human beings, about 50 percent of the food that they eat becomes waste. Another aspect is the stress on the system. The body has to process all this food just to get a small quota of energy for its daily activity. If we ate foods with the necessary enzymes, the system would be functioning at a completely different level of efficiency and the conversion ratio of food to energy would be very different. Eating natural foods in their uncooked condition when the cells are still alive will bring an enormous sense of health and vitality to the system. When it comes to food, it is about the body. Ask the body what kind of food it is most comfortable with, not your tongue. The kind of food your body feels most comfortable with is always the ideal food to eat. You must learn to listen to your body. 
As your body awareness evolves, you will know exactly what a certain food will do to you. You do not even have to put it in your mouth. You can develop this kind of heightened sensitivity whereby just looking at or touching the food will be enough for you to know its potential impact on your system. Chapter 9. There is an intrinsic intelligence within you. This intelligence is what makes all things happen. Have you ever watched a beehive closely? It doesn't matter whether you have studied the most advanced level of engineering, there is still something to learn from a beehive. What a fabulous feat of engineering it is. This is truly the best apartment complex you could imagine, exquisitely designed and structured and amazingly resilient. In no kind of weather, have you ever seen a beehive falling off a tree? Have you? Although it is a magnificent piece of work, do the bees have engineering plans in their heads? No, these plans are in their bodies. They know exactly what to do because of a blueprint in their systems. Spiritual knowledge, or knowing, was always transmitted like this, not by thought, not by word, but in the same way that bees transmit the understanding of how to build beehives across generations. Once this knowing is transmitted or downloaded, as it were, everything that you need to know is right within you. When you download a certain type of software onto your computer, you don't have to understand how all of it works. You don't have to read every word that is written in the software. You press one key and it produces a result. Another key, another result. Suddenly you have a different kind of phenomenon. There is a distinction between knowledge and knowing. Knowledge is essentially accumulated information. All information is only related to the physical nature of existence. Knowing, on the other hand, is a living intelligence. With or without you, it still is. You are either in it or you are not. That is the only choice you have. There is a distinction between knowledge and knowing. Knowledge is essentially accumulated information, and knowing is a living intelligence. There is an intrinsic intelligence within you that, as we have seen earlier, is capable of transforming a piece of bread into a human being. The most sophisticated machine, including the brain, was created by this intrinsic intelligence. Right now, you're just trying to use a limited section of your brain, and you think that is intelligence. No, there is something within you that can create an entire human brain in all its magnificent complexity and capability. That something functions in an altogether different way. For example, you don't think with your head, but with every cell in your body. This makes your thinking an organic, seamless, and integrated process. There is a certain level of integratedness about it because it involves all of you. You don't have much thought in your mind at all unless you choose to think. Nothing has ever been out of place in this existence. Things have only been out of place in human societies. Between this piece of life and that piece of life, there can be a comparison, but for the intelligence that is making all life happen, there is no context, no comparison, because there is no other. You cannot say whether it is now in place or not. It is always in place. There is no other way for it to be, and the pursuit of yoga is just this moving from this small head full of information into a cosmos of intelligence. What a tragic choice people so often end up making, choosing the finiteness of the human brain over a universe of infinite knowing. Conclusion the only solution for all the ills that plague humanity is self-transformation. Self-transformation is not incremental self-improvement. Self-transformation is achieved not by morals or ethics or attitudinal or behavioral changes, but by experiencing the limitless nature of who we are. 
Self-transformation means nothing if the old remains. It is a dimensional shift in the way you perceive and experience life. Knowing this is yoga. One who embodies this is a yogi. One who guides you in this direction is a guru. Try this. You may have noticed this about yourself. When you are feeling pleasant, you want to expand. When you are fearful, you want to contract. Try this. Sit for a few minutes in front of a plant or a tree. Remind yourself that you are inhaling what the tree is exhaling and exhaling what the tree is inhaling. Even if you are not yet experientially aware of it, establish a psychological connection with the plant. You could repeat this several times a day. After a few days, you will start connecting with everything around you differently. You won't limit yourself to a tree.